Well, if you guys will, um, grab your Bibles. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 1 still. Um, tonight we will finish up this chapter of Mark chapter 1 and, and dive into our, our next chapter. Um, we are uh, looking uh, at the last, um, actually six verses of, of this chapter here tonight, beginning at verse 40, and really looking at, at Jesus uh, touching the untouchables um, and uh, certainly seeing the compassion of Jesus in this in this story. So um, let us read our, our passage tonight and then we'll, we'll look at a little bit of overview and then um, get into this section. So um, Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And it says here, and a leper came to him, to Jesus, uh, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it, and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. Uh, from every quarter. So we've been looking at this, this theme uh, in Mark's gospel here in the very first uh, chapter here that we've uh, been looking at quite regularly, and that is the authority of Christ, his authority that he has and uh, as being the Son of God. And we continue to see that authority here tonight in this passage. Uh, John announced whenever at the beginning of this gospel, whenever he came onto the scene, that John announced that, that Jesus was coming or one is coming who is greater than I. He will come, he will baptize, not with just water, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. He will come with the authority of God. And immediately as we seen Jesus step onto the scene and his ministry open up, we saw that authority. Uh, Jesus came into the synagogue and he, he taught in the synagogue. And it says, uh, as he was teaching there in Capernaum, that the people were amazed, saying he taught them as one with authority. Uh, he spoke with power. His words were with power. He had the commanding voice of God himself because he was God. And we continue to see this, this authority in which Jesus possessed as, as he was in the synagogue and the demon-possessed man came forward. And Jesus, uh, seeing this demon crying out with a loud voice, Jesus displayed that authority over the forces of darkness and he commanded the demon to be silent and to come out of the man and, and the demon listened. He obeyed him because of the authority that he had. The demonic spirits, the, the evil spirits must listen to the authority of Jesus' voice because he is the son of God. He controls the whole universe. He has come with his kingdom to take back the world that had been taken controlled by Satan and his demons. And the last time we, we spoke on the book of Mark, we, we looked at another display of Jesus' authority, and that was his authority over the curse of the fall. And we saw that through the diseases in which he healed. He, he left the synagogue, uh, and he went to, to Peter's house, where his mother-in-law lay sick. And Jesus come to, to break the curse that, that had fallen, the diseases from the fall of Adam. And as he seen the mother-in-law laying there with a fever or disease, the Bible says that he, he touched her. He grabbed her hand. He lifted her up. And she was healed. And it says immediately she got up and she served them to show that she wasn't needing a recovery period, that she was completely healed. She went right back to her regular everyday task of what she could do. And it was Jesus' authority to break this bondage of the curse that he healed this lady by touch. And Mark continues to talk about this, this authority that Jesus has as he talked about him uh, continuing to, to cast out demons and continuing to, uh, to see these diseases uh, as they were, as it says, that at sundown, after the Sabbath was over, that all these people started flooding the doors of, of Simon Peter's house. And Jesus healed them. He cast out demons. He was touching them. And, and he was showing his power. 
he, he basically eradicated the diseases that were in Capernaum and, and cast out the demons that were there. And, and Mark showed us this was all done in one day. This was the life of Christ in one day. That he, that he preached, that he, he cast out demons in the synagogue, that he healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, and then he, he healed most of the whole town of Capernaum that came to him. And, and then, then Mark, I guess to take a step back from the action of Jesus' authority, takes us away from the scene of Jesus' actions and, and kind of gives us, I guess, an insight into where this authority comes from. As Jesus stepped away from, from the action of all these people and he goes into a desolate place and the Bible says that he goes to this desolate place to pray. He secludes himself. This is the source of Jesus' authority. He realized that his source came from above. It came from the Father. His, his authority came while he was here on this earth as being dependent upon the Father, as being obedient to following the divine plan that God had set out. And as Peter came searching for him, because all the people were looking for Jesus. They were wanting him to come back. You, hey, act two is coming up. The show is not over with you, Jesus. What in the world are you stepping away for? And, and, and Jesus, as we, we even spoke about in our men's study this morning, instead of going back into the town and continuing with the fanfare, Jesus said, we must go to the next town. For I am called to, to preach the gospel. I'm not called to heal. I've come to heal to show the power of the kingdom of God. I've come to heal to show the power and authority that God has given me and that I am God and that I show you this authority and the kingdom is here. But my purpose is to preach the gospel. My purpose is to, to proclaim the, the good news that, that I am the savior of the world, that I've come to die for the sins of the people. And so Jesus moves on to the next town. And now in our passage today, we, we return to this display of Jesus' authority with this, this third specific miracle in this opening chapter. As I told you when we first started these uh, with, the, with the synagogue being casting out the demon, there was a series of four uh, miracles here. And the, the fourth one we'll see next week when he hears, heals the man that is uh, paralyzed. But we see this and we see Jesus' authority to teach. We see his authority to, to, over the powers of Satan. We see his authority over the curse of the diseases. And today we'll see Jesus' authority to bring purity from the defilement. We'll see his authority over even the law. And Mark shows his authority by recording for us Jesus' encounter with this man with leprosy. And this encounter is also recorded in, in, in Matthew 8 and also again in Luke 5. And I guess it's, it's interesting that I told you Mark is a very concise and very fast-paced gospel. It took Matthew 8 chapters to get to the story. It took Luke four, 5 chapters to get to the story. And Luke is doing it in chapter 1. So we see this fast pace of this gospel. So the first thing that we see tonight in the story that Mark records for us is that we see the leopard's desperation. Or you could even say the leopard's audacity. It says here in verse 40, it says, And, Jesus, and, it says, and, and a leopard came to him, imploring him, kneeling to him, If you will, you can make me clean. And Mark tells us that this, this man comes to Jesus who has leprosy. He doesn't tell us anything about the man himself. He just tells us about the condition of this man. Now, the, the Greek word for, for leopard means scaly or rough. Uh, leprosy in the ancient world could revert, refer to a variety of skin diseases. Um, it could be things such as boils or, or, or burns or itching or ringworms or some kind of scalp disease. Uh, scribes have have counted up the 72 different afflictions that could be classified or defined as leprosy. Uh, in Leviticus, Leviticus 13, you can read about the different skin diseases that fall under the umbrella of leprosy and how they handle these cases. And if the person uh, had one of these conditions described in, verse, uh, in Leviticus 13, then they would have to go to the priest, 
uh, who was the protector of the people. Uh, and the, the priest would have to determine whether they had leprosy or not. And the priest would determine whether they were clean or unclean. Now, true leprosy, which is known as uh, Hansen's disease today, is, is a flesh rotting disease. It is caused by a bacteria that gets in the body and destroys the flesh. It destroys the nervous system. There are causes where it can cause blindness. There's this, it's, it's a terrible disease uh, that could come on a person. And in the ancient world, it was a dreaded disease. Uh, it was a disease that oftentimes in the Old Testament was even regarded as being a divine judgment from God. Uh, Leviticus gives us two whole chapters, chapters 13 and 14, on this disease on how to handle it, how they were to handle the disease, and what they were to do if they were given or had the disease and was cleansed of the disease, what they are to do. But the disease itself was, is considered practically incurable. In every occasion in the Bible of the healing of leprosy, it was always the miraculous power of God that healed the person of leprosy. Uh, Numbers 12, uh, 2 Kings 5, even in Luke 17, and even here in Mark's Gospel of chapter 1. If a person was determined to have leprosy, uh, this person must follow the prescriptions of the law. Uh, I just want to read this passage for you because I didn't want to read whole the, the, all of verse of, of Leviticus 13 because I, I want you to stay awake for the rest of the, the message. So I um, didn't want to bore you because if you read this, um, you would sit there and think you're reading like a dermatology book and you would... Definitely probably get some good sleep while I'm sitting here reading. But listen to what it says here in Leviticus 13, 45. And this is, this is the, uh, what the law prescribes here for a person who, is, who has leprosy. And listen to what it says is here. It's the, leper, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. He shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And this passage of scripture is not a description of the disease, but it's almost written more like a sentence to the people who has this disease. It was written as a sentence to protect the people in the community from this disease. Uh, these people had to make themselves as repugnant as possible so people could spot them out and stay away from them. Uh, so they won't become unclean as well. The disease was more or less a death sentence in every area of your life. Uh, one commentator said, stated this, this is uh, leopards were victims of far more than the disease itself. The disease robbed them of their health. And the sentence imposed on them as a consequence robbed them of their name, occupation, habits, family, and fellowship, and worshiping community. Uh, Josephus uh, spoke of the banishment of leopards as those in no way differ differing from a corpse. Uh, the reference to Miriam's leprosy in, in Numbers 12, 12 uh, prompted some rabbis uh, to speak of leprosy as the living dead, whose cure was just as difficult as that of rising someone from the, raising someone from the dead. So these people had become social outcasts. They were cut off from the, community, from the covenant people. Uh, they were cut off from worship. They were cut off from their families. They were cut off from any social activity. They, they lived alone for the rest of their lives. And then you also not only had the, the idea that they were separated from all these things, but you also had the stigma of the disease itself, uh, which the rabbis often increased. If they walked into a house, the house would be considered unclean. If they stood up under a tree or passed up under a tree and you passed up under that tree, you could be considered unclean. Um, Alfred Edersheim said that some rabbis would not even eat, a, uh, eat an egg purchased on the street that a leper was on. And some rabbis even boasted that they would throw rocks at leopards to, to keep them away. And some would run and some would hide themselves from them. So this is, this is a terrible disease, uh, socially, spiritually, not only physically. So, so we can see why this man, when he hears about Jesus and hears about this one who can heal diseases, who, can, who has the authority to cast out demons, well, we can see why he would be compelled to come to Christ. 
Why he would be compelled to, to, these people will be compelled to be drawn to him. And in his desperation, this, this leopard man came to Jesus, breaking all the purity laws that, that were the custom of keeping their distance. And he came there and he kneeled before Christ and imploring him. Luke's gospel says that he fell on his face and he was begging Jesus. And notice what he, what he says to Jesus in the verse 40. If you will, you can make me clean. This, this man recognized something very important. He, he recognized the divine prerogative of Jesus. In other words, he was not questioning Jesus' ability to heal but his willingness to heal. It is never a question of the ability of God to be able to heal or act or move. It's the, the willingness of God to do something in accordance to his divine will and his divine plan. And the leopard recognized this truth. For this man to, to come to Jesus with the trust that Christ could heal him if he wills, it really almost makes a testament to Jesus' reputation that someone who is an outcast, someone who is who was cut off from the community, has heard the reputation of who Christ is, that they would desire to to leave their seclusion, to to do so in the uh, in the violation of the laws and the customs of their land, to to come there to Christ and fall before his knees. And, and some commentators and scholars believe that this imploring and this falling would be even him clenching the knees of Jesus, begging to be healed. But notice what he asked for. He asked him to be made clean. And in this passage, we never hear one mention of him being healed. But we mention, but clean or cleansing is mentioned four times in six verses. Uh, leprosy in the Bible is never considered to be healed. It is always considered to be cleansed or cleaned. Other diseases in the Bible are healed, but leprosy is the only one who is cleansed. In Mark 10 and 8, it says that he's come to heal the sick, to rise the dead, to cleanse leopards and cast out demons. In Mark 11 and 5, it says the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news preached to them. There's only a, a very few words more terrifying to the Jewish person than that of unclean. The word deemed them separated from their society. And more importantly, it deemed them separated from God. So to be healed of leprosy was to be cleansed. It was to be made clean. It was to be brought back into the fellowship of society. It was to be brought back into the communion with the covenant people and to be brought back in communion with God. So for this man to hear about Jesus' authority we see why he was willing to risk everything to come to Jesus. We, we see why he was willing to risk breaking the law and the custom to come and fall at his feet and beg him if he will. We can see his desperation or even his audacity to come to Christ to compromise the cleansiness of the people and possibly even compromise the cleanliness of Jesus himself. But the second thing we see here is that we see Jesus' concern. This leopard comes to Jesus. He's believing in the ability to heal. He's not presuming on the willingness of, of him to heal him. He says, if you will, you can make me clean. I, I know you have the ability to do so. I know you can make me clean. This is the idea, do you will to do so? Do you desire to do so? But Jesus' response was just as shocking as the leper's desperation to come into him and approach him. Listen to what it says in verse 41. It says, Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him. And he said to him, I will be clean. Jesus saw this leper and he had a concern for it. I found this interesting in, in this, this study. 
the, the ESV, if you're reading it or you're reading really any, it's about most English translations, it says that he was moved with pity or Jesus had felt compassion. Um, there are a few manuscripts that read that in the Greek that Jesus was being indignant or Jesus was angry. Matter of fact, if you read the NIV or the New English translation, it actually says Jesus was indignant or Jesus was moved with indignation. And many scholars feel like this may be the, the, the appropriate translation in the text due to some different things we won't discuss tonight, but do some different things with the context of the text. But, but if this is the appropriate reading that Jesus was indignant or Jesus was angry, then the question is, is what was Jesus angry with or who was Jesus angry with? And that, that's the question. Now, now scholars believe this and, and, and would agree with this, that, that Jesus wasn't angry with the leopard coming to him. And there's a few reasons why. One, because it's out of character of who Christ is, according to what we have in the rest of the Gospels. So this wouldn't be his character in the rest of the Gospels. Secondly, he heals the man. If he was angry at the man or had indignation against the man, then certainly he would not have healed him. And thirdly, he couldn't have been angry at the man for possibly coming there to, to possibly make him unclean by being associated with him because what did Jesus do? We'll see this in a little bit. Jesus touched him, which would have made him considered unclean. So the anger is not directed at the leopard, but what most scholars believe is, is that his anger would have been because of the ravishing effect of the disease and the social and the religious effects that was making this man an outcast. He was angry at the fact, at the sin that had caused this effect to take place on this man. The bondage of Satan, the anger of the sin, the effects of sin, on this man. The effects that the community was having towards this man to ostracize him, even though he was to stay away, but yet he was still an, a, a person created in the image of God to be shown compassion. But Mark, Mark definitely wanted the readers to understand Jesus here with an emotionally affected by this encounter. Even if indignation is the proper translation, it still shows the compassion that Jesus had because his anger was derived from the concern that he had for this man. And Jesus sees this man before him and he's moved towards him with this, uh, because of this, 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 the effect of sin. He had compassion on this man. And Jesus does the unthinkable here in verse 41. He says he stretches out his hand and he touched him and he said to him, I will be clean. Uh, Jews would have recalled at this. You remember I told you they were throwing rocks to keep him away. Much less being in, in close proximity to where they could reach out and touch the man for being fearful of being unclean. And you know what? This man could have expected this from Jesus too. Since this is what he had been a part of his whole entire life since he had this disease. I mean, he could have very well in his mind saying, hey, I'm taking a chance to go to this guy who's able to heal that he might do the same thing that everybody else has done to me. He might kick me out. He might throw rocks at me. He might be angry with me. He might cast me out as well. And you know what's it is interesting to me anyway is that Jesus did not have to touch the man to heal him. There, there's plenty of miracles that Jesus did where he heals people without touching them. Matter of fact, he healed some people that he wasn't even in the same town that he was in. And I can imagine that the, that the touch of Jesus to that man meant as much to the man as Jesus healing him. We don't know how long this, this guy had leprosy. We don't know a lot how long he had been an outcast. I imagine one day would be too long if you ask the leopard. This could have been years that he spent in seclusion without the embrace of a loved one. 
without the fellowship of family or friends. And what it must have meant to that man that, that Jesus, in his compassion, touched him. And, you know, I guess in a sense, Jesus is also calling us in, in a roundabout way to be people who are willing to touch the leopards, who are willing to reach out to the outcast, who are willing to show compassion to those people. But this, this, this touch was more than just an emotional touch to show compassion for him. This touch was a healing touch. It was a touch that cleansed him. Uh, Jesus was not concerned with this man making him unclean. Uh, he is the Holy Son of God. Uh, and instead of the leopard making him unclean, the holiness of Christ made this leopard clean. And that's the power and the authority that he has. And Jesus told him, I will be clean. This man was questioning the willingness of Jesus to be able to heal him, not his ability. And Jesus responds to this man telling him, I will, I am willing to heal you. And he spoke the word, be clean. And in verse 42, Mark tells us, and immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. The son willed it and it happened. It is divine authority. He spoke. And the disease went away. In his authority, he spoke and the man became clean. This leprosy must have been, at least had the visual effects of the disease because the leprosy was a very, if a person had it for a long period of time, was a very uh, distinguishing disease because it would cause such defiguration among the body and especially around the eyes and nose and face area. But it, it is almost as if that it, it just vanished away, even the disfigurement of the disease. Even today, if leprosy is healed, you can, you can be healed of leprosy, of the disease of leprosy, but the effects of leprosy is still there, of what damage it has caused. But this man would have been completely healed. He was made completely clean. And not only was the, was the disease removed, but his social and religious sentence of banishment had been broken as well. You see, Jesus did what the law was not able to do. Jesus made this man clean. Sinclair Ferguson made this statement. He said, the law was powerless to help, this, to help the leper. If a man were clean, the law would not condemn him. If unclean, it could not save him. It was unable to change him. But what the law was powerless to do, Jesus did. Jesus did what the law and no one else could do for this man. He made him clean. And he made him again a part of the worshiping of the covenant people once again. And, and I can't help but think whenever I was studying this passage... about us spiritually. The friends, before Christ, we were spiritual leopards. I recall the passage that we studied when we was in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Remember that you were, at that time, separated from, from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. <laughs> what does that describe? <laughs> sounds like seclusion to me. It sounds like it would sound like the language that would possibly be, be used towards a leopard person. It goes on to say in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We oftentimes 
don't see ourselves as the spiritual leopards. But Jesus touched us and he made us clean and made us whole that we can approach him. But not only do we see Jesus' concern, we also see Jesus' command. Listen what he does here in verse 43. It says, And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. Sternly is a, is a strong word in the Greek. Uh, it actually means snorting. It's like the flaring of nostrils. It would be described of, of an animal who was, who was flaring his nostrils, snorting before he begins to charge. And to send away here is equally a strong word as well. It's the same word that is used to cast out demons. So, so Jesus is giving a, a very strong command to this leopard. And some believe that this is the reason why uh, that word in the nation or indignant is, is possibly a proper translation because of his sternness here. And something is odd that Jesus is being stern here. In the way his tone is. But Jesus wanted this man to understand the, the seriousness of this command. And, and some scholars have, have said that the reason why Jesus was so stern, possibly, is because he knew what the leopard would eventually do. And so he's trying to be stern in saying, don't do this. But listen to the command that he gives him in verse, the beginning of verse 44. It says, and see that you say nothing to anyone. So, so Jesus is commanding this man to go and tell no one what happened. And this is very counterintuitive. I mean, man, Think about this. I mean, this, this dude had leprosy. He has been outcasted. He hadn't seen his loved ones. He hadn't seen his friends. He hadn't been able to hang out. He hadn't been able to go to Jerusalem and worship in the temple. He hasn't, he's been cut off from his, his livelihood. He can't work. He can't do these things. And all of a sudden, this man has given, Jesus has given him his life back. And now you're telling me, Jesus, I can't go say anything about this? But Jesus wants him to be quiet. And if you notice, this is the third mention in Mark's gospel of Jesus telling someone or sell, telling someone or something to be quiet for what he's done. The first two occasions is with demons in Mark 1, 25 and 34. And this is the first time we see Jesus telling a person who has been healed not to say anything to anyone, not to disclose this. And this becomes a common theme in Mark. There's three occasions where he silences demons. There's four miracles where he commands silence after the miracles. There's, there's two occasions that he commands the disciples to keep silent. And there's two times that he withdraws from the crowd to escape detection for not being exposed or not being tell people to know exactly who he was. So, so why is Jesus not warning the people to tell them who he is? And probably the likely reason is Jesus did not want a misrepresentation of who he was to go out to the people. Uh, these people were looking for a political messiah. You see, on several occasions, they even attempted to make Jesus king. They wanted him to free him from the Roman oppression. And Jesus' role as the messiah was not to come to be a political king Jesus' role was come to suffer for the sins of the people. And so Jesus was, was wanting to keep this silent. And there's another reason why Jesus wanted to keep this silent. We'll see this in just a few minutes. But, but listen to the second command that Jesus gives to them in verse 44. It says, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. He, he wanted this man to, to go to the priest. He would have had to went to Jerusalem because he had to make a sacrifice at the temple. If you follow the prescriptions that, that is in Leviticus uh, 14. And so he wanted him to go to the priest to, to show himself, to follow the prescription of the law. Uh, the priests were the only ones who could, could deem this man as being clean to go and, and follow the, the, the religious, the Jewish system. And once this man was determined to be clean by the priest, then he had to make certain sacrifices, and then they would give him a written certificate of his cleanliness. Put him back into society. 
And there's two possible reasons why Jesus commanded this man to go and make this sacrifice and, and follow the accordance to the law. Uh, first, for this man to be ceremonially back, ceremonially back into the community. To, to get this uh, without going to the priest, though he'd have been sacrificed and without making the proper sacrifices, though he would have been clean and healed, he would have still been considered unclean in society. So Jesus was saying, go and make yourself clean according to the social law. But secondly, he wanted him to go there and be a testimony to the religious leaders of who Jesus was and the power that he had. He wanted him to go, uh, the, the leaders were going to be confronted with the authority in which Jesus possessed, that he was able to heal this leper. And as I said, this disease was basically incurable. In the, in the Old Testament and, and really any time in the Bible, when you've seen this miracle or you've seen this disease cured, it was by the miraculous work of God. And they would have recognized this. And we'll see next week, we begin to see this beginning of this conflict in Mark's gospel of Jesus and his religious leaders. He wanted them to go and be a testimony to the authority, the cure of, that he was able to cure the disease and make this man clean. And finally and fourthly, we not only see the leopard's, disobe- or, or the leopard's uh, desperation and Jesus' concern and and Jesus' command, but now we see the leopard disobedience. Jesus gave this man a, a stern command not to tell anyone and to go make your sacrifice, but, but listen to what he, he does in verse 45. It says, But he went out and he began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and and people were coming to him from every quarter. So instead of listening to Jesus, this man goes and he talks freely. Tells everyone, I assume, about what happened. And as a result of this man's disobedience, the Bible says that Jesus was no longer able to enter into the towns and preach the gospel. His fame had begun to spread so, so rapidly that he had to go out to desolate places. And you never hear of Jesus going to the major cities of Capernaum. It was always, or the major cities of Galilee, you always see him going to the smaller uh, mid-sized towns. And this could be another reason why he wanted him to keep silent. Because Jesus knew that this would become a, a thronging of the people that would, that if he kept silent, that he could freely move in and out of these towns and cities and and preach the gospel. And this is where we begin to see the ministry, the the Galilean ministry of Jesus start to kind of come to a halt, so to speak. It begins to, uh, to become slowed down due to the crowds. In Mark's gospel, especially, the crowds often become viewed as a deterrent to Jesus' ministry. They often hinder the advancement of the ministry of Jesus and the message of the gospel. So we see this miracle. But it was interesting as I was reading as one commentator kind of brought out in, in this miracle we see almost like a, a trading of places between Jesus and the leper here in this story. And we, we first see this with, with Jesus touching this leper. One writer stated this. It said, by touching him, meaning Jesus, by touching the leopard, he was really saying, I am prepared to become by choice what you are by nature, a man under the judgment of the law, in order to share with you what I have, freedom and life. 
And he goes on to say, as in all miracles, so in this one, Jesus is showing his grace and salvation. He is demonstrating the power of his kingdom, but he is also demonstrating the way in which the kingdom comes through identifying himself with us in our sin and bearing the judgment of the law of God against it. See, Jesus was willing to become what this man was. He was willing to take on his uncleanness. So in order for this man to take on who he was, his holiness and righteousness. Another way of Jesus trading places with this leopard is also in verse 45. When it says, but he went out and meaning the leopard, he began to talk freely about it and, and spread the news. And so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were coming out to him from every quarter. But before this man was healed, he was an outcast who, who lived in a desolate place. And Jesus was able to freely roam throughout the cities. But after he was healed, he was the one who was freely able to roam in the city and Jesus was now the one who was in desolate places ministering. And this definitely becomes a picture of our salvation that Jesus takes the place so we can, we can enjoy the freedom from sin. This is the fulfillment of the role of the Messiah. He takes the place of his people. He takes the place where he takes their sin and we take on his righteousness. Isaiah 53 and 11. Out of the anguish of his sin, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge shall the righteous one, listen to this, he's talking about Jesus here, but shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, but he shall bear their iniquities. Paul mentions this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is, as Martin Luther said, this is the, the great exchange. He touched a leopard, taking his sin, that the leopard could be cleansed, taking his righteousness. So it shows us here in this account in Mark that Jesus has the authority to cleanse the defiled sinners. He has the authority to do what the law and the traditions could not do. He can make this man clean. And he has that same authority today in our lives that he can do what the law cannot do. You know, that's what, Mar or what Jesus wrote. Um, in Romans chapter 8. Where it says here, verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That, that's odd whenever we are the, the spiritual leopards who are, and I told you in the Old Testament, often now spiritual leopards are, are, leopards are considered to be under the judgment of God. But yet, he's saying there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. For the law of the spirit of life has, has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. For listen to what this, listen to what he says in verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You see, he had the authority over even the law. As I said, the, the law can't change us. If we were clean, it would just not condemn us. If it was unclean, it was the judgment that sentenced us. But it could not change us. Christ did what the law could not do. He came, he fulfilled the law. 
that those who are in Christ meet the righteous standard of the law through the Holy Spirit. And we are deemed to be righteous, taking on the righteousness of Christ. He made us what we're not. He did what the law could not do in making us clean because he took our sin. He took the judgment of the law for us to fulfill the law and to cleanse us of our sins. And he he did this because he was willing to touch the untouchable in his compassion and his love for his people. Father, we, we thank you. Thank you for such a, a wonderful passage, God, that we are, that has carried throughout the, the ages for us to read and study today, to know and understand the great compassion you had for this leopard man. God, such an outcast, separated from from family, separated from loved ones, separated from from the community and the body of worship, separated from you. God, every person that would have been around would have ran and hid. But yet, Lord, in your compassion, God, you touched him. We're willing to take the sin and the the uncleanliness that God, he could take on the righteousness of who you are. God, you made him clean. God, even in our spiritual lives, Lord, we we were spiritual leopards. We were separated. We were alienated, cut off from the covenant. But God, you, you came and you lived a sinless life. You died on the cross taking the judgment of our sins. That, Father, when we come by faith, we find ourselves in you, as Paul often said in his epistles. By finding ourselves in you, God, we, we are taking on the righteousness of of Christ and we find ourselves protected from the judgment and the wrath of God because you have taken that judgment and wrath for us God is uh, such a wonderful wonderful truth and God we, we, we thank you Lord that we, we see these things in this in the story with the leopard so awesome to see your compassion so often to see the authority and the the power that you possess Father I I pray that we would would be as this leopard that we would never doubt your ability to move in any circumstance that that we're in we just pray for your willingness Lord we just pray that your will be done We know it's never a question of your power and authority or ability. It's just we know that you you are you have set out a divine plan that is perfect in every aspect. And God, if we'll just trust in that simple truth, no matter what we're facing in this world, we realize that God is, is for your glory working according to the plan that you have set in motion. God, we just trust you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.